somebody. Hello, children and people and friends. I'm Vince, also as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. And Wizards of the Coast were nice enough to send me some free gear, some free sealed product. Today, I'm going to open this box here so you can live vicariously through me cracking packs. Because it was sent by Wizards of the Coast, I'm going to avoid swearing profusely. I guess swearing at all, really. A quick disclaimer. I do believe that cracking individual packs is not the way to get singles. I'm not gonna say don't do this at home because if you want the, I'm not gonna say the works, I think they'll hate that. It rhymes with shamble. If you want the risk, if you want the risk, reward, feeling of opening these, if you just like the feel of, of crinkled packaging between your fingers, if you just wanna like, just crack them for the hell of it, then sure, if you get fun and enjoyment out of that, go ahead. I don't know why I've set the camera up so low. I should have set it up slightly higher. Because when I sit up, my, my moves straighten up, sure, but you can't see me. But if you're looking to buy singles for Commander, Legacy, Modern, or dare I say it, Standard, just buy the singles. It's more cost efficient. And then you can live vicariously through this video. Part of the new series I'm calling deck a -dance. Did you get it? It's the word decadent. deck a -dance. But I replaced the first part with the word deck, like a magic deck. So you ready for an adventure? Of course, this playmat shows you that I am sponsored by ChannelFireball.com who bring you a lot of the content on this channel. So, we're gonna crack open this booster box of Throne of Eldraine and have a look at what's inside. Now, like I said, the best value to have with sealed boosters is to, in fact, draft them. But we ain't doing that today. We're just gonna crack these packs, see what's inside, and talk a little bit about the set. stop to do is focus on uh, certain key cards that people are excited to see, like uh, showcase frames and such. So I believe these are the European ones because we have this up at the back. This is the new event adventure token. There we go, that's the adventure token you use to declare or at least denote where the adventuring creatures have gone. If you're not aware of adventure, it's the mechanic where a creature will have a spell attached to it, which I'll show you in a moment. Oh, here we go. Here's an adventure card. This is Brazen Borrower. This is a three mana fairy that has a two mana adventure. An instant speed bounce a permanent and opponent controls to its owner's hand. Return a target non land permanent. Uh, uh, an opponent controls to its owner's hand. And then at any point later on, because it has flash, you can flash this in and it turns as a three mana three one. This is a card that is very confusing for a lot of people. So, first, let's go Brazen Borrower, right? It don't borrow anything. <laughs> there is nothing being borrowed in this art or this flavor. It is bouncing things, which is traditionally sort of like a like a time uh, ebb or time flow effect uh, or blinking effect, if you will, like in terms of theme. It's not borrowing anything. And then it's a 3-1 flash attacker. The point is, this is a very efficient creature that will see some play in some sort of tempo decks that want this, whether it be standard, modern, legacy, or Highlander formats. Um, it's reminiscent of Vendidian Clique, except for the effect it's put across two turns. Or It costs you five mana instead of the three, and you can't flick it with like a Restoration Angel, which is one of the, the big downsides for me. But there's no doubt about this card being an incredibly efficient uh, creature to play with. The other weird thing about Brazen Borrow is that it's a mythic, when it doesn't feel like a very unique effect, even though it is a powerful and efficient creature. Part of me wonders if this was a different card in uh, production or development, and very late in the design portfolio they changed things. Uh, once upon a time, Brazen Borrow was a higher CMC stealing card over at Mythic, and they moved this effect from a, a rare onto this, and vice versa, and la 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 la. Or it's left over from another design portfolio got turned into a fairy, but I doubt that very much, because the adventure effect. Like I said, when you adventure it, it's exiled, and to denote that, you can use this token, which will show that it's on an adventure. And let it online, you can cast it from the Adventure Exile Zone. It's the same Exile Zone as everywhere else, so it's affected by Exile effects like uh, um, the, the Wasteland Strangler uh, processing effect of the Eldrazi and Rift Sweepers and all that jazz. You can put it back into people's libraries and hands. But yeah, this is uh, one of the better ones, and it's pretty good first Mythic from a box. And the rest of this pack is sort of uh, not exciting stuff. I'm going to go through the commons and uncommons like this very quickly. A highlight cards that I think are interesting. I think Golden Egg is pretty cool. I'm looking forward to playing that in standard a little bit. Perhaps 
Uh, it's an egg effect in a quite literal sense, in the sense that it's an artifact that draws a card, and it's literally a golden egg, and it's referenced the golden goose, so I'm pretty pretty in on that. That's pretty cool. The other card of note in here is this Edgewall Innkeeper, because I believe from the moments on Twitter and the deckless dumps I've been seeing from like, the fandom events, this card might see some play in standard as well, of essentially just drawing you cards when you recast your adventure creatures, giving you a huge amount of value when you're playing like a blue-green adventure in standard. One pack in, one mythic. Let's go. What else we got? We got Once Upon a Time. This is another card we need to stop and talk about. Once Upon a Time will be showing up on my channel soon. I was going to film it today. I don't know if I'll get time today. I'm going to talk about this card being playable in certain strategies that are basically very degenerate that want to find their um, combo pieces quickly. Now, people have talked about this in Legacy and decks like Belcher, but well, I talked to my Discord with a few people who've played more Belcher than I have, and the problem with decks like that is that they only play one land and minimal creatures that matter. I think this would probably be better in, in Modern, trying to find Allosaurus Riders in the Neoform deck, although the problem with the Neoform deck is that it doesn't want other lands or creatures. Well, lands are okay, but there's no other creatures to find. So maybe hitting your land drop might be the right thing for this. It's a free spell, regardless. And then things like Seven Land Belcher or Amulet or, or Tron might want to try this over things like Sylvan Scrying, but never over Ancient Stirring, because Ancient Stirring is just a better card than this for finding lots of utility. Either way, I think it will see some play. How much play is yet to be seen, but I'm going to try it on the channel in some more degenerate uh, combo decks in modern. And then we're looking through the rest of the pack for storyboard cards. No, we found nothing in this pack for story, but we found more, some more adventure cards, but nothing exciting. So it drains all about fairy tales, and I think people have been ragging on the fairy tale aspect of this too much, saying it's too much like Shrek and too much like Disney, and I think that's kind of nonsense, really. Uh, ba -ba. We've got a Lock Mere Serpent. This card's like a control finisher, I guess, but I'm not very excited for it myself. I'm not going to really play it much. It has flash, and you can sacrifice islands to make it unblockable. You can sacrifice swamps to gain life and draw a card. And you can exile target card from an opponent's graveyard and return the serpent from your graveyard to your hand. I don't know, it's a six mana control finisher of some kind, but I don't know if it's good enough in current standards. because it's just better things to be doing. Did we get an adventure frame? Did we get an adventure frame? No, we did not. No, we did not. I just realized these cards are upside down. I should turn those around. Next pack, what do we get? A forest swamp. It looks very nice if the camera focuses. Look at that. The lighting in my, in my, my back room is not very good. These burn willows actually, or not burn willows, these like pseudo burn willows, these glowing things in the trees look very nice in that foil. So we'll put foils over here. Then we opened Araya, first of the Lock Wayne. Lock Waith? Lock Waith? Lock Wayne, God. I'm so bad with names. This card's cool. It's like a um, uh, kind of like the opposite of a. Uh, Blood Artist, it only cares about black creatures entering the battlefield, but you do have the ability to tap and sacrifice cre another creature to draw a card, so it allows you to grind whilst also establishing board presence. I've seen some people playing this on Arena in like mono black or black white aristocrats decks, even though its mana cost is quite intensive. I think it's quite a cool build around Commander as well, but apart from that, I don't see seeing any other eternal play. Cool card though, much cooler than, um, well, well, we'll get to that when we see other legendaries in the set. Some of them are a little bit lackluster in my opinion. Any showcase, any showcase, any showcase frame. No. Absolute whiff so far. I would have expected at least seeing one in three. One in three packs is meant to have a showcase in them. We've done four packs now and not seen a single showcase. So we're down on showcases, but we're doing okay for mythics. Another once upon a time token. Another mountain. And then we've got Realm Cloaked Giant. Another mythic. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't feel like a mythic that's going to, like, you know break the bank or make you any money. However, I do think it's one of the better five mana wrath effects we've seen in a while. And it's a five mana wrath that later on you can recast out of exile into a seven mana, seven, seven vigilant creature. This card's pretty strong in the sense of uh, being able to like uh, wrath aboard, establish power to turn a corner and then uh, smash your opponent's tits in. 
Um, I think this is probably a card that we're most going to see in cube. I like this as one of the five mana wrath effects for the white decks in sort of modern or unpowered cube. Uh, once you get into powered cube territory, it doesn't seem any quite as good because creatures matter less. But um, yeah, solid. Uh, but a bit of a whiff in terms of a mythic, in terms of value, if we're getting truly decadent. But I'm going to put my mythics over here. Did we get a showcase card? No, we didn't. Oh, blah, blah. That's my little song. Uh, cards of note in here. We've got the uh, instant speed uh, cycle one card for another card. Fake this looting alternative adventure card. Well, I've seen a dredge player already playing this in modern. Whether that'll stick around, I don't know. And also, I just really like the flavor of gold locks. Gold locks is like a very cool utility creature that can like sacrifice to destroy artifacts. But uh, if you draw it late in the game, you just tap for seven mana to get three, uh, th three two two bears. Uh, yeah. It's just a cool card. I really like it. Like, like I said, I think people are going too hard on hating on Eldraine for the the fairy tale stuff, right? Like, saying it's like Disney and uh, and Monty Python and Shrek all tied together is a bit unfair to the creative design that's gone into the set. Like, the courts do feel well realized. There's interesting characters and thematic elements there as well. Food tokens. We'll probably see some food creatures in a moment, so we'll talk about them. Forest, which we care a little about, and then we've got Wish Claw Talisman. Interesting card, it allows you to tutor, and then it gives itself over to the opponent. And you've got three wish counters on it. So this card, I think, would be fun in Commander for Politics. I think it's interesting for um, Standard because, well, as, as Cube April pointed out on Twitter, you can wish for Teferi, play Teferi, bounce this back to your hand, draw a card, and now you've got a Teferi that you've tutored for. And then every turn after that, if you you can do other things. Like, uh, if you already have Teferi in hand, you play this, you Demonic Tutor for what you need, and then Teferi is back to hand, and suddenly you've cast Demonic Tutor and your opponent hasn't, and that feels pretty good. So on its own, it seems pretty bad, but if you can bounce it, uh, or basically break the parity, the obvious way of doing such would be the three mana Teferi in current standard, the card gets a lot better. So it's a commander card, maybe a standard card, and I guess in eternal formats, it might be good much, much further down the line. The problem being, like, in the combo turns of like legacy combo decks, not only is it two mana to, to deploy it, but it's one mana to activate it down here as well. So it's actually a three mana tutor, at which point it's not much better than say scheming symmetry, putting things on the top of your library, or infernal tutor just being absolutely uh, abusable with lion's eye diamonds. So I just don't think it's very good for eternal formats. I'm gonna put that here. This is rares that I care about. This is mythics, and this is uh, just general rares. Did we get a showcase frame? Did we get a showcase frame? No, we did not. Jeez. Louise. Not a single showcase yet. And we are, how many packs in? Are we one, two, three, four, five, six packs in? And not a single showcase frame. I'm very surprised. Okay, what have we got here? We've got a uh, no table required. Play arena where there's no table required. Wizards, don't, don't do that. That makes me feel a bit sick. Support both sides of your game. 25 years you've been making bank off of us. Let you know, give us some, cut us some slack. Return to Nature, which is a modal destroy target artifact, destroy target enchantment, or exile target card from a graveyard. Is it strictly better than Naturalize? I mean, it's got a pumpkin in the art, which kind of makes that the case, right? Pumpkins and mice are cool. It's also in foils. I'm going to put that here for my foils. Oh no, here is foils, sorry. And then we also opened a Plains. We also opened a Charming Prince. Okay. Let's talk about this for a moment. This will see some play on the channel in the next week or so. I'm gonna try it in either modern or legacy DNT or with a cloud herder, a soul herder deck, sorry. Um, I don't think it's that good. I know there's some people that have been saying they put up results with it in Death and Taxes in Legacy, namely because it's a flicker that doesn't die to Ren in six. Um, I think that when you stick four in a deck and then get lucky anyway, because sometimes magic's about variance, right? Like that's what all my five O's are, luck. Um, you <laughs> You can 5-0 with any 4 of in a deck, right? I think it might be pretty good in humans for like resetting your Thalia's Lieutenants and such and like, like pumping your entire board, also giving you life gain against burn in modern. Um, the problem is it's not as versatile as Flicker Whisk because the, the best thing that Flicker Whisk does is target your opponent's stuff and this just does not do that. Um, so yeah, I think the card's cool. I think the fact that it's a charming print and it's got a charm in its text box of three modes in mono white. It's also a really cool mono white creature which we don't see very often. Uh, I think it could see some play, but saying it like it replaces Wisp or could be the four of it against Wisp is weird because Wisp solves so many problems that this just cannot. It can only target your stuff and it can only target your creatures. It can't save lands off of a bar and stuff from a wasteland, for example. Card's very, very cool. I think it's going to be playable. I just don't think it's as good as Wisp by a huge margin. Now we've got just more non-showcase. Huh. 
I just want one of the storybook frames, you know? Well, I'd like at least one extended border in this in this booster box as well, as you can get them in normal packs. No table required. Cheers, wizards. Thanks, wizards. Thanks, Obama. This is Witch's Vengeance, which is choose a creature type and all creatures that type it. Minus three, minus three until end of turn. This card's pretty good. Uh, it might see some eternal play because you can pinpoint remove creatures off the board without wrapping your own board. So you're playing like a... F What's a black tribe? Fairies or zombies, I guess, to an extent. More zombies than fairies, I guess. But you can you can name the 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 opposing creature tribe. Humans, for example, or spirits, and just wrap their boards. And the travel decks are a thing in modern. Um, you can also just pinpoint remove X3s. Um, or like a true in Nemesis. Naming Murphy will get a Murphy off the board without you having to kill your own Delvers and Legacy. So this might see some play in a ton of formats. I think the card's actually quite good. And then we've got no special frame. Wow. Oh, okay. Let's talk about this card quickly. This is Mystic Sanctuary. It is a common. This is pauper, legacy, and perhaps modern playable too. So as it reads, I'm going to have to read to make sure I get this right. Mystic Sanctuary enters the battlefield tapped unless you control three or more other islands. When it enters the battlefield untapped, you may put target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library. What this card can do is it can put things like Terminus back on top of your library off of a Flooded Strand because it is a fetchable island. It counts as an island towards other copies of this. It counts towards an island for many other effects as well, like High Tide, for example. So this is a fetchable card that can reset things on top of your library for Miracles, for High Tide, for Blue-White Control and Modern potentially as well. Um, always remember it's about islands, not basics. I've seen people on Twitter <laughs> say they thought it's basics. They fetched up two planes before this, fetched this and whiffed. But I mean, getting to reset the Thomas Top of your library to know for certain you're drawing your next turn is a pretty big beating, right? I think this card is very, very good. It's one of my top picks for the set for Eternal Formats. I think it's definitely my top five if I were to do a top five video. But I didn't, because we were talking about the cards that we like in Dice to Removal, uh, the episode which I'll link to in the cards of this video. So yeah, I think Mystic Sanctuary is a definitely, definitely a highlight card of this set. I'm going to put it over here in the cool commons and uncommons slot. Next up, we have a, a very adorable board token that is so cute. Jesus Christ, the art's so good in this set. We've got a foil, um, uh, what the hell is this called? Death's, Deathless Knight? Yeah, the foiling's quite nice, not, not quite as nice as that forest, a swamp, sorry. And then we've got an island and a gilded goose. Now, I think it was just absolute, I wanna say, uh, cosmically good coincidence or perhaps just providence that this this set released around the time of Untitled Goose Game. I've downloaded Untitled Goose Game on my Switch and I haven't even loaded it up yet because I haven't got round to it since getting back from Canada and, and Portland for all the content I made over there. Uh, but this card's cool. It's like a Birds of Paradise for standard. You make food off of other things as well. It's seeing play. It allows you to turn two and Oko and then tick up, which seems pretty damn good. Um, yeah, I, I like this card a lot. I think it's going to see quite a bit of play as standard. I don't think we'll see any effect in eternal formats, if I'm honest, unless we see some sort of broken food card in a future commander deck, but I doubt it very much. And then we've got, once again, not a single showcase frame. Wow. Okay. Come on. Let's get some uh, some goodies now. We're, we're whiffing a little bit. Fairy token is carrying like a needle as a weapon, which is pretty cool. Was a half a scissor? I don't know. Still a cool token, though. Forest. And our third mythic is Rankle. Which I always want to call Sprankle because of uh, Spranks, but it isn't. It's Rankle, Master of Pranks. Get it? Rankle, Prankle? Uh, it's a flying, hasting 3-3 three, three flyer for four mana, double black, and two. When it, when it deals damage to... No, it's just combat damage to a player. So it's combat damage to a player. Choose any one of the following. Each player discards a card. Each player gains one, loses one life and draws a card. Or each player sacrifices a creature. It's just incredibly versatile, and it's a, like, it's a hasty threat as well, so you can get it in there out of nowhere. It can kill Planeswalkers, importantly. So down tick Teferi to bounce something on your board. You draw this, you can swing in and kill the three-mana Teferi in standard. The, 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 the abilities are symmetrical. That's one of the things. Like You each discard a card, you each uh, lose life and draw a card, and you each sacrifice a creature. But if you've got abundance of other bodies on the board, if you want to discard things so you can use Bone to Ash or whatever it's called, Bones to bone, blood to bones, bone, the, the reanimation spell is standard, whatever it's called. Then this is pretty good. And the drawing of cards can just get you ahead when you need to. Uh, the extra one ping might even be good because then you're actually doing a four point, uh, four points of damage with this on the attack as well, which can just kill people. Um, this card's very, very good. 
Uh, I'd rate you above, above Realm Cloak Giant for constructed play, but below Brazen Borea. And hallelujah, we have a showcase frame, at least one here. One of the best arts like this as well. So this is Emberith Shield Breaker. This is the Chateau, is that correct? It is the Destroy Target Artifact for one red mana Sorcery Adventure, and it's a 2-1 after that. It's not quite a Manic Vandal, which is a 2-mana Destroy Target Artifact when it comes to play, which you could flicker. I think the being able to flicker these is very good, but the versatility of drawing up the late game to be a 2-1 body or a Shatter Effect, or Shatter Effect early into a 2-1 body, it's just very, very good. This has got to be a cyborg card in standard, right? But I don't think it's good enough to see Eternal Formats uh, play. But this art, the, the, just the contrast of the blacks on whites with the red, and the way the red goes with the frame as well. I've been ragging on Wizards a lot. I think Collector's Boosters are kind of lame. I think the confusion around like several different frames at once and different draft products and some sort of deluxe collection and how rare are these, how rare are those, how rare is this? All that is very, very confusing and very, very, I don't know, it stinks of Yu-Gi-Oh in a way. But with all that out of the way, I can't help but commend and give credit where credit is due because I think this set is incredibly flavorful regardless of whether you think it's on the nose or not. And the, uh, the design work, what's gone into these things, right? Like, people got, got frustrated and mocked. People like to be negative, and we all mocked the and joked about the, the frames of the the Amonkhet masterpieces, but God, how good do these frames look? So, yeah. I think that's pretty, pretty good. Next up, Giant Token, Mountain, and then we've got Oathsworn Knight, which is the, the reference to Monty Python. Uh... I'm not excited about this card. I think it'll be pretty good in standard, I guess. But outside of that, I don't think it's going to see any play. And we failed to get another showcase card. Okay. An average pack. Next up. Adventure card. Island. Hup! Ooh, Castle Lock Wayne. Lock Thrain? Lock Twain? Lock Gain? Either way, this is a black, a rare land that comes to play untapped. If you can draw another swamp, is that correct? Just one swamp? Yeah, just one swamp. The, the whole range. This cost is all very good. Even the green one that I was ragging on a little bit uh, because I just want to be a bit contrarian, I'll, I'll admit. Uh, this card allows you to draw cards and take damage equal to the number of... or lose life equal to the number of cards in hand when you do. It's a very good card for edging forward with card advantage in black decks, especially aggro decks where your hand's going to be empty the majority of the time. All of the cycle are good. Uh, I think this might be the best one, followed by either the green or the blue one. Um, followed by the red one, and then the white one's probably the worst, but it's still pretty good. These are going to see some play, and they might even see some eternal play. Uh, it's going to be a commander staple, that's for sure, because it just draws cards off a land. It's a free card draw effect on your land slot. It's pretty good. Any showcases? No. Wap, wap. Next pack. Yeah, ooh, ooh. I thought for a moment it was a show, showcase foil borrower. I would have been excited. But this is just the this is the counter target spell of three CMC or less, and it's a flying creature, and that foiling is absolutely gorgeous. Look at that. Oh, wizards, give me more of that. This is the thing I'm saying about the confusing nature of it all. But in once it's on, once the execution of the product is out of the way, and we've got just the the, the raw asset. It's so nice. And then we've got this ridiculous card. This Blue Sun Zenith on a body. Instead of shuffling it in, it's also a 3-3 three -three that taps stuff when you cast blue spells. This dude is going to be a fun commander to play. We've got an EDH and Shield episode coming up where we're going to be playing with some members of the community uh, with uh, Eldrain commanders and Eldrain themed... Well, just commanders, really. And Gadwick is my second pick after another card in the set that I'll talk about when we open it. Food token. Foil Island, again, very nice. Look at that. Swamp. Giant Killer. Yeah, it taps things, and it's also a spell that kills things. Could be a bit player in modern if we had like another Eldrazi Winter where we have to play with things like uh, um, ridiculous white cards to make DNT good again. But other than that, I'm not that high on this card. Uh, it's fine. It's just not very exciting. And again, no showcase frame. Bear. Oh! <laughs> Jackpot! I'm gonna have to beat that bad boy out. That is a foil fabled passage. Oh, that's going straight into Tachiopa. Oh. 
Oh, 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 oh. That is... A, it's gorgeous. B, it's a fetch land. C, this will be a commander staple. Whether or not there's any actual eternal play, I, I'd probably hazard to guess no, because the, 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 the prismatic vista is just better alongside other fetches. We've got, we've got critical mass of fetch effects now for these decks, right? But it's a commander staple, and that's a foil one. I'm going to be playing that in Tatiova. Anything else in this pack? No, nothing. Nothing at all. Next up, we've got the cool new opt art. Opt's cool. Huh! Clackridge Troll, a trampling haster. When it ends the battlefield, it gives your opponent goats, and they can sack goats to stop you from uh, attacking with this 8-8 eight, eight trampler for 5. And you gain 3 life and draw a card. Um, I think this card could see some play somewhere in some sort of weird deck. Some fringe thing that I play on my channel. But in terms of tier eternal play, probably not. It feels like it could be the very next... Um, Desecration Demon. That card was very good. But it is one mana more. But that said, it's an 8-8 with haste. <laughs> so the, the turn you play it, you draw a card and gain some life, right? But if they kill it, you just give them a lot of bodies. And you spent 5 mana and they've killed it with like a... Like a Drown in the Lock or something. You're like, ah, oh, balls. So I'm undecided on this card, but it's probably more likely to be a whiff than a hit. Anything else in here? Nope. Next pack. Token land. What? Okay, let's see what let's do this for a second. This card. This is an EDH card for certain. There is a druid that does the same thing that's been expensive for a while. Um, the name literally eludes me right now. Uh, it's quite an expensive card. It does the same thing this card does in terms of tapping for mana. One mana of each color on opponents you control. However, this is a three mana, two colored component. So it already taps for two. And it gets bigger for each color. So it's going to be a minimum of a two-two vigilant creature. This card's really good for commander in, in three, four, five, six color decks. Six color decks? <laughs> I think this card's pretty good for commander. I'm going to put it in this pile here. Our Ghost Fast is probably the best mana dot we've seen for commander in a while. There's a bucket. A tray bucket. Next up, we have food. We have island. And then we have Stolen by the Fae. A rather unexcited, pretty good limited card. Might see a small amount of standard play, but I'm not particularly excited by this card. No more showcases. So we've only hit two showcase frames so far, and one of which was foil. Interesting. Interesting. The arena advertisement, planes, and Hushbringer. I'm not going to talk too much about this card because it's already a card that I talked about dice to removal. I talked about it on Twitter a little bit. I've talked about it on Facebook a little bit. People are asking me, "Do I, am I going to play some DNT?" It's a flying life thinking one two that turns off your Stoneforge Mystics, Recruit of the Guards, and Flicker Wisps. So I'm just going to go out on a whim here and say no. Uh, there might be meta games where this gets very, very good. As we return to Theros, and like the underworld is a theme, perhaps as Elspeth claws away out of it, we might see a lot of death triggers. So this could become a very, very good card in standard or in eternal formats if a new archetype arises because of that. But ultimately, no. I think Hushbringer is it's a it's a cool hate bear, but I don't think it's a hate bear that hates on DNT too much. The art's incredible, though. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Once again, no showcase. This troll is just solid and standard, right? Like, it's a 7 6 for 6 mana. It's triple, it's quadruple green. So you have to play in a green, stompy, or ramp deck. It has vigilance, it has trample. And it makes food when it comes in, and it can recur itself. A solid standard bit player that I'll see play in ramp decks. Aside from that, I'm unexcited. If there ever was a food deck in eternal formats, perhaps it'd be one of the payoffs. But I don't think there'll ever be a food deck in eternal formats. Unless, again, we said, food comes back in another format and it's broken in half. Or we see some sort of food-based tireless tracker in a future commander product. Oh, do there we go. We see another cool legendary, the green dude who just grows. He just grows and grows and grows. It comes in as a 4-4 for 3. 
whenever the green creature enters the battlefield, if under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on your vote. If that creature is, is bigger, if it's stronger than your vote, put two counters on. The fact that it's a zero zero puts counters on himself means that he's a counters commander. Uh, so you can put doubling season with him and he's a three mana eight eight, for example. Uh, you can remove counters from him with those sort of effects. You can put counters onto him with hardened scales. He's just it's just cool that he's a zero zero that does that. Uh, you can also hex drinker or vampire activate him to death, weirdly. It's, it's cool, it's unique, I like that when they explain, explain, explore interesting design space. I'm going to put that in my success pile here, because like I said, I can see fun commander with that card. Um, something that I imagine Rob would play. You don't need a table! <sighs> grumble, grumble, grumble! Old man shouts at clouds. Way we got another showcase frame. A rare this time. We got a love struck beast. This is the Beauty and the Beast riff. Her uh her -huh, Disney makes a one one and then it's a five five for three that can only attack or can't attack, should I say? Unless you control a one one creature. Importantly, it's a five five blocker for three mana that early on makes a one one. Uh, off of that clover card that's in the set, it makes two one ones early on for one green. So yeah, card's pretty good. I'm gonna put that in my showcase pile over here. Pretty happy with that. What else do we get? Any other showcases in here? Nah. Ooh, let's talk about this uncommon very quickly. This card is going to see play in combo goblins. It's going to make the deck a consistent turn... Oh, sorry, turn two. Combo... A uh, tier two combo deck in modern. Um, I'm really going to champion that deck. It was very fun when we played it before, where we had to play Rhythm of the Wild to combo off a red cap with a sack outlet like Skirk Prospector to put counters on it to kill people. This puts counters on everything. Every non-human. So all of your gobos. It's also true of Rolf Matron and Fire of Rolf Ringleader. The card's... Pretty damn good. Also, he looks like a druid from like, I don't know, well, he just looks like a really cool druid. I know he's a shaman, but who cares? I imagine this is what like a lot of druids in D&D, the druids of uh, of Lord of the Rings look like, whatever his name is, in uh, The Hobbit. The one with the poo on his face. Food, swamp. Oh, it's a foil swamp. It just doesn't look for in the art, in that, in that light. Glossy, but okay, cool. I like it. It's three foil bands so far. Hutta! We've got our world champion, uh, Javier Dominguez. Yes, Javier Dominguez. Not Javier Bardem, as I always call him, who's an actor, and not Javier Dominguez. First Strike and Haster. Uh, and whenever you, it attacks, you can give plus one plus zero. If you control a knight, it's plus one plus zero. And also, equipped abilities cost less to put on it. Just a first Strike and Hasting big boy in the, uh, in the night deck. A two one in the night deck. Solid card. I'm unexcited by myself, but it's cool. I, I like the design space and everything. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. We've got another another very nice showcase frame. The Beanstalk Giant, which is like the, the, the Rampant Growth with a, a later body attached to it. It's one mana more than the a normal Rampant Growth, but I mean, later on you get like a 7-7 seven, seven or 8-8 eight, eight or 9-9 nine, nine or 10-10 ten, ten out of it. If you're playing Rampant Growth in your commander deck, I would consider just upgrading it to this, especially in this frame, perhaps a foil version of this. It's a very cool card. Human, Mountain, <laughs> Castle, Garenbrig. This is where uh, Voyo, Yorvo, is from. This is the one that I've been ragging on a little bit. People think it's going to be like an Amulet Titan card, or some people said Scape Breach, or Titan Breach, or Scape Shift. I don't know if they ever play play this card, but but I can imagine Amulet play, has playing one. I was very down on it until some Amulet players had explained to me the very upside. I mean, like, I see the upside of an earlier Titan, but I was like, they play Titans pretty early as it is. Does this really increase the chances? It effectively ramps you by one, because um, you'd have to tap four lands and it, so it ramps you by one, but that means if you can play enough lands early in a deck like Amulet, or something similar, then you're playing a Titan one turn earlier. And playing a Titan one turn earlier is, well, it's playing a Primeval Titan one turn earlier, right? Card's perfectly good. I was uh, very down on it online. I'm still down on the fact that I don't think it's just like, I don't think it's broken, but I think it's probably a bit player in some decks in modern. I'm very willing to be wrong if it turns out to be like it makes Amulet too good. But I just doubt it. But I'll put it in the, the hit pile in terms of rares. And then did we get any other showcases? No. But we did get Drown the Lock. Which I think is going to be a card that may see a turn of play as well. Uh, Counter target spell or kill target creature. As long as its CMC is less than the card in its controller's graveyard. And in Legacy most things only cost one, two or three. <laughs> this card's going to be pretty good. I'm up and down the lock. A professor convinced me. 
I had completely missed that this card wasn't any good until the professor was like, you know what? Drown the lock seems good. Knight, island, of planes even, and a fable passage. Hooray! Uh, we didn't talk much about when I opened it before. Basically, it's a fetch land for standard. Uh, it's a fetch land that's good in the late game, poor in the early game, but better than better than the evolving wilds just in general because it's the same early on and better later. And I think it's going to be a commander staple. Um, so I'm cool with that. I'm cool with fabled passages in my trade binder. That's another thing. Cracking boxes does flesh out your trade binder, although you're better off again to spend the money on singles. I'm honest, but cracking packs is fun. Ooh, a foil Merfolk Screen Street Secret Keeper. It's the one that mills for four and then it's a zero four afterwards. Not all that exciting. Forest. Ha! A Stone Coil Serpent, which feels like a leftover from the War of the Spark design file, right? It's a protection from multicolored thing. Yeah, that's got to be a card from that. It's a zero costing zero zero, so similar to Endless One. It's probably better than Endless One in the decks that now want those effects, like uh, the Bridge Vine decks we've seen in the past. I'm going to put it here in the hits pile simply because, like I said, it'll be a bit player in weird decks. In weird, weird decks, like the Bridgevine decks of modern at some point. It basically is a str almost strictly functionally better upgrade to Endless One outside of any Eldrazi deck. We're getting down to the last, the last ten. Food token. Island. Huh. Another Clackwood Troll. I'm going to put that in the Whiffs pile because, like I said... I just don't know if it's good enough to really fill his bits. And then we've got the non-foil hypnotic sprite, which is cool. The f I mean, the f I think I'm one of my favourite foils I've seen in the set so far. I will show that more on camera when we summarise at the end as I say goodbye to my friends. And my friends being you, you lot at home. Does this look like a disorganised mess? Tell me in the comment section below. Is this a disorganised mess, or is it an organised, or is it a messy organisation? Garrick Emblem? Come on, I want to open it, Garrick. We've only opened three mythics so far. Island. It's Piper of the Swarm! It makes rats, and then uses said rats to st oh, what am I doing? God, I'm losing, I'm talking, I'm losing sight of what I should be doing. Piper makes rats and steals things with rats. It'd be cool in a rat commander deck, I guess, but other than that, I think it's a bit of a whiff. I just think it takes too long to get online. Might be with Pack Rat, perhaps. Maybe that's the key part I need for Pack Rat Stompy and Legacy. Hmm. No pack felt like it was already open. Weird. Dwarf token. I love that token. That token's very cool. A foil true love's kiss, which destroy target uh, enchantment. Was it enchantment or artifact? Or artifact and draw a card. So it's a perfectly good uh, commander card, I guess, in a budget list. Um, interestingly, when you have like a removal effect in the limited of this, like the casket and trapped in the tower, it's all these um, the actual the things that stop or break those things in the limited environment are actually parts of the story. So like the casket and the trapped in the tower, true love's kiss being kissed by like you know a charming prince or, or princess is what stops those effects or breaks those effects. So you can tell your own story and build your own story as you play. That's what Dan Holt taught, taught me at the pre-pre release, and I think that's really cool. It's quite a nice foil as well, uh, but I'm gonna put it over here in the not so exciting foil pile. And then we've got Swamp. We've got Bone Crusher Giant. It's rather like straightforward. It's a burn spell that also then the L becomes a body. This card's going to be a very good card in standard for the mono red deck. And if you're not playing four of it in the mono red deck, you're probably, probably doing it wrong. You're probably doing it wrong. Okay, we have uh, seven packs to go. And I could do with opening a couple more mythics if I'm completely honest with you. You do not need a table. Yeah, I do need a table for actual magic. Our Flash. Reach, creature that grows when you play non-humans. Eh, limited bomb, I think, but uh, not all that exciting. And then we've got the really cool uh, showcase frame of uh, Goldilocks here as well. I really like this art. This frame is the one they used to spoil it all, so it's going to go in here. I like the pumpkin carriage as well. It's a pretty, pretty flavorful motif. This limited environment seems very fun. I should play some. Knight. Ooh, foil seal. Oh, I wish it was. That I didn't even have yet. Uh, this is a foil Sir, Sir Eleonora, the discerning. Draws a card, but it's a battlefield power and equal to a number of cards in hand. And it's got the Frost Titan, sort of like a deflection ability of having to make cost two more to remove it. Nice foil. Uh, I would have preferred a foil of the black, the green, or the black legendary. Oh, so the, that's the uncommon one. The black uncommon one's my favourite. I don't think we've opened a single one of Sir Conrad. Our rare was the uh, Return of Wildspeaker, which is two effects from, from Garrick. 
the first effect is draw cards equal to the greater power among non-humans you control, which is basically the minus three of the, the five mana Garak, Primal Hunter, I think it is. And the other ability that you can choose is your creature plus three plus three until end of turn without any trample or evasion. Which is the minus four of original Wild Speaker without the trample. Uh, pretty good limited card. Apart from that, a bit of a whiff. I guess it's a versatile in Commando because you can have it as your win con and or your draw spell. So, you know, maybe it's okay. Get rid of those. <laughs> Fires of Invention. This card is cool. I think this would be a like, cool, fun standard deck. There might be some weird modern decks. I think Merrin MTG is playing one of those I saw on Twitter. Uh, where you get to play cards for free. So if you can draw multiple cards and just double spell every turn as you hit land drops, you're going to be in a good spot. It's a very cool piece of design. I really like it. Like I said, props to the set. The flavor is on point. There's a lot of very cool and interesting design and design space explored. Um, like I said, I'm more just annoyed at the application of the product into the marketplace, if anything. Is that Sir Conrad? That is not Sir Conrad. Jesus, where's Sir Conrad? I really like Sir Conrad. Food. Ooh, we've got Foil Uncommon Red Legendary. The one that, like, this card is legitimately very good, right? Like, it's an absolute bomb and limited. It is a 3-3. Three, three. One of it deals damage. Does it? No. Yeah, whenever it deals damage or instant sorcery deals damage to your opponent, you can exile top card of your library. Let me cast it that turn. It also taps to ping your opponent. So it's, oh, no, sorry. Taps to ping any target. So we can kill X ones. Uh, yeah, this is a good, efficient source of card for one. It could be a very cool commando as well, because you can just chain removal spells on top of your library, or burn spells on top of your library. I am into it. I am into it. Opening foil legendaries is always a good time. Oh, baby! Yeah! Yeah! Yes! Yes! It's Gar Oh, I just threw it across the fucking thing. Oh, my goodness. I'm just too excited. Can I pick it up without scratching it? Oh, there we go. Okay. Garrick. Garrick Daddy. Big, old, thick lad is back. I know some people aren't that like, enamored by Garrick and not excited about him. My only attachment to him really is that I quite like a lot of the walkers that he's had. They're very good. I also like this whole, like, I'm hunting people across the universe because I'm a bloody axe murderer thing. I mean, he's been redeemed now with the with the return of the wild speaker. He's no longer bail cursed according to the story, if you didn't know. There you go. There's some Lorthos. Vorthos thing for you. This is six mana walker that makes two walls. Whenever either of those walls would die, they have an ability already strapped onto them. That this gets loyalty. Not just this though. All Garricks. All Garricks. Garrick Tribal. It's on the menu. I should play it in modern sometime soon. The minus three is to destroy a creature, draw a card, so it actually protects itself that way as well and draws your cards. And the minus six, which is only one loyalty up, so all you need is one of these walls to die. Or to proliferate. You get an emblem, creatures you control have plus three, plus three, and have trample. Yeah, this guy's a bit of a house. And a scary card when he comes down against you uh, elsewhere. I'm gonna put, I would put him in the hit pile. I'm gonna say he's my second favorite mythic we opened after Brazen Borrower. No, that's not true. It's my favorite mythic I've opened here, but I think Brazen Borrower will see more play across the turn off formats. But Garrick is just cooler. That's four mythics. Can we get a fifth mythic in our final three packs? Is that a thing? Oh, what was in the rest of that pack? Did we get a showcase? Bum, bum, bum. Rat, Island, Hutcha, the Red Castle, which is red, red, and one. Give your creatures plus one plus zero until end of turn. It's pretty good in going wide. It's probably pretty good in the Cavalade deck or whatever it's called in standard. I'll put that in the hit pile. And then, do we get a showcase? Do we get a showcase? Do we get a showcase? No. Oh well, I got a Garrick. I am happy. Garrick with the Garrick emblem. That's right. Big old thick lad. Big old thick lad. Food. Land. Charming Prince. Where did I put that? I put it on the whiffs of the hits. I put it in the hits. Um, yeah, Charming Prince is fine. <laughs> he is just fine. Like He's exciting in maybe one deck. It's a shame, really. Um, I don't get excited by white cards so much anymore. I just feel like white decks are really getting beaten up a lot in channel formats. Death and Taxes, for example, in Legacy. It's just played so badly. This is our final pack. It's our final pack. Can it be a good one? Can we get that last fifth mythic, right? What's the, I don't even know what the average number of the box is these days. Is it four? Not two. Oh no, it's not mythic, it's a rare. It's Stormkirk Crusader. It is a two-two with menace. 
that at the beginning of your turn, each pair draws a card and loses their life. Very similar to the fact that Rancor has got that ring on it as well, which is interesting. I don't know how good this card is. I think it's very good if you're a super aggressive red-black deck in standard, or Rakdos deck, although it's a knight from a plane where the, the, the kind of Rakdos doesn't exist. That's a whole different video to discuss the, the naming conventions of colours and stuff. If you're a super aggressive red-black deck, this is probably very, very solid. Outside of that, like in Limited, I don't think it's very good, because you're just drawing your opponent cards, and drawing your opponent cards in Limited seems bad. Outside of standard and Limited, I don't see this seeing any play anywhere. I'm going to put this in the whiff pile. It's probably quite a good bit playing standard, but apart from that, it's just not going anywhere. Any more for any more? Did we get a showcase card? No, we did not. How unfortunate. Right, let's do a summary. Right, kids, here's my summary. Here are my foils, including the highlight of the foils, A Fabled Passage. Uh, currently priced around 20 bucks. I'm just excited to have a foil one. I didn't open a foil prismatic Vista when they were being cracked, and now they're incredibly expensive. Uh, it could go up simply because of the demand for it in, 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 in Commander. It will never reach the price of the Prismatic Vista, because Prismatic Vista, in foil especially, is designed not only for Commander, but for Legacy and Modern as well. Uh, these are my showcase cards. I got one, two, three, four, five, six in total. There's going to be one every three boosters, so 36 boosters. Eh, bit low. Uh, I got one rare one, which is the Love Shot Beast, which is a pretty good one. It's one of my favorite frames and arts in the set, alongside the, the Beast and the, the, uh, the, the Flaxen. This one, the art's good, but when it's in foil, it's even better. This is my favorite foil I've opened, uh, other than maybe the Fable, because it's actually even playable, but this is just gorgeous. Then we opened uh, bad rares, or rares that I'm not too excited about. There's all this lot. Some of these might be good commanders, like, like Araya, but nothing that I think is going to set the world like, outside of being standard chaff that will eventually rotate and become a potato in a box somewhere that I'll trade in for a penny at a GP. And then we have the playable or exciting rares, which are all these ones. Stuff that I think I would actually play in commander, or in, or in modern or in Legacy. And then finally, finally on mythics, we had Brazen Borrower. We had Realm Cloak Giant. So hit, minor whiff. Although if I rebuild my cube, he's definitely going in there. Rankle, Master of Pranks, which I think is pretty good. Again, could be a commander, although I don't think it's a very exciting commander. And then Garrick, a Cursed Hunter. I'm glad I've got at least one walker. So it is the walker that I would like to have opened, alongside a Garrick emblem as well. That was my box. Let me know in the comment section below whether you think it was a good box or a bad box. Perhaps the Foiled Favourite Passage just pushed over towards, towards being a good box considering you've got four minutes instead of five. Let me know in the comment section below. Let me know if you enjoyed this deck agent video. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring my bell, ding-a-ling-ling. -ling. And until next time, be good to one another. I'll see you all very, very soon with some gameplay tomorrow. Ta-ta for now.